you are tuned in to a fireside chat with Zany Mystic. Join us now on another exciting metaphysical journey. Relax, tune in, drop out and take a seat by the fire as we explore new realms and possibilities. This is Magenta Pixie. You can find me at magentapixie.weebly.com. But now, here is Zany Mystic and guest. Enjoy the show. Welcome, everyone, and happy 4th of July. Tonight, I'm thrilled to be doing a special 4th of July show with returning guest Jessica Murray. Jessica trained as a fine artist before graduating in 1973 from Brown University, where she studied traditional psychology and linguistics. After a stint in political theater, Jessica began a study of metaphysics and has been practicing and teaching astrology in San Francisco for 30 years. In addition to her monthly Skywatch, Jessica writes commentary for DaykeeperJournal.com, as well as articles for the Mountain Astrologer, Psychic and Spirit Magazine, and other publications. Her new book, Soul Sick Nation, An Astrologer's View of America, is an in-depth study of the global role of the United States, its recent past, and near future. Jessica lives in the Castro District of San Francisco. She offers a full range of astrological readings by appointment on weekdays in a professional, comfortable setting complete with a pot of fine tea. Now, before wel- welcoming Jessica, I just want to comment that her book, Soul Sick Nation, is truly a groundbreaking and monumental achievement. It's among my all-time favorite books for its shocking clarity, metaphysical views, and deep wisdom. I cannot praise it highly enough. So let's welcome Jessica back to the show now and find out more about what's going on in the USA on this 4th of July. Hi, Jessica. How are you? Hi, Lance. (laughs) Nice to hear you. Well, uh, thank you for returning to do this special broadcast. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, there is so much popping in the stars right now, and I was beginning to, to mention to you just seconds before we went on the air that I had an epiphany during the evening of the summer solstice on June 21st, sitting around the campfire with friends. Um, and in your writing and your blog, you mentioned that we these numerous shifts that are occurring back up to about the 21st of June. Yeah. <clears throat> Can you uh, share about? Uh, can we start there, or do you? Yes, you we can start, start there, but only if you promise to tell us your epiphany. Okay, I will. After I talk about the transits. Okay, I'd um, be happy to. You know the 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 solstice this summer took place on a new moon, and always the solstice or the equinoxes set the tone for the season. So it isn't just a one shot deal where you look at the transits on the sky mm-hmm. on the day of the solstice, and it. It only means what's going on on that day. Mm -hmm. They have more significance than that. They set the template for the whole season to come, the whole three months to come. So that's why astrologers pay so much attention to solstice transits. And this one, which Mm -hmm. was the June 20th through 22nd, was a gaggle of, of transits that blew our minds because it was just, it was such a complex little cobweb of <laughs> cycles, uh-huh. including the new moon, which means that the sun and the moon were involved. Wow. They were conjunct the asteroid Vesta, which uh-huh. has to do with a kind of sexuality that I think we can see in the Mark Sanford episode. We can oh, talk yeah. about that in yeah. detail. They yeah, were opposite, opposite Pluto. Huh. Both of them. All three yeah. of them were wow. opposite Pluto. My goodness. And what's going on now is the sort of the other shoe dropping from all that, which is that this week, the first week of July, Mars and Venus are squaring what we call the super conjunction, which is Neptune, Chiron, and Jupiter. And many of your listeners will have heard of this. Mm. It's such a, it's an overriding uh, conglomerate of these three rare, rarely meeting up planets, Neptune, Chiron, and Jupiter. It's such a big deal that it colors all of 2009. And now the um, the solstice transits have kind of run into the super conjunction. That's mm. why there's so much going on. Wow. Now, and you're going to ask me what it means, but well, before we pick it apart, tell me a specific question that can lead into that. Well, um, geez. 
Uh, the, <laughs> now I'm on the spot. <laughs> no, I can just talk and talk. If you oh, don't, you don't well, I, I do. Go I ahead. I noticed that, um, for, I'll just briefly tell you what I saw on that night. Yeah. Of the 21st. Um, I was drinking heavily with friends, and we were having a wonderful time by the campfire in the mountains, just bonding and connecting and, and so on and so forth. How beautiful. And one of my friends, who's a Native American Indian, pointed up to the sky and pulled me out of my reverie, and I saw what appeared to be shafts of, of just light, just subtle light, wow. like the reverse of the crown of the uh, Statue of Liberty, coming at rays coming out from behind the mountain and just going off into infinity and i couldn't believe my eyes and i uh, we both saw it and we were trying to figure out well what is it and then we eliminated searchlights and and lights from the city and mm-hmm. within 10 to 15 minutes it unlocalized and it moved to other locations and these rays were coming out and forming different formations so it wasn't a searchlight or it wasn't wow. city lights. And we watched it for a very long time. And then I went back unconscious. And, and the next day, I had an epiphany and I stopped drinking. I mean, it was like substance oh. abuse issues were just boom. And I turned on a dime and I said, okay, that's enough. I quit. Wow. And, and it was just astonishingly that's sharp. That's incredible. That's turn. so beautiful. And when they were making other formations, yes. after they moved from behind the mountain, what kind of formations were they making? It was almost like a curling, a curling effect. There were like several rays that split up, and they kind of separated, and they just continued just going out. And then a, a second ray kind of broke off from that, and it just kind of curled up like almost like a wisp of smoke, but it wasn't uh-huh. a wisp of smoke. Trust uh-huh. I know. It's like when you look up in the sky and you see phenomena like that, you immediately think of clouds, which also look like things and then reform and then oh, yeah. curve. So, I mean, that's the only reference point I can think oh, of. Oh, believe me, these, this was an etheric energy. It was just, yeah. it was so fine. It, it reminds me of the crop circles on the ground. Ooh. Oh. I mean, here's an aerial version. You call them formations. and. Uh-huh. You know, these are, we don't know how to allude to such things because they're not really made by earthly hands. Right, right. So here you have one in the sky like we've been seeing in Oxfordshire on the ground. Yes, that was my, I was going to ask, that was the question. Have you, have you heard about this crop circle uh, phenomenon that's coming to a head supposedly on July 7th yeah. And what is the significance of July 7th? Well, July 7th is a full moon eclipse. Oh, yeah. So it's a, you know, it's one of those eclipses of the summer that we, we map out. And it's part of a series of transits that is the, the other shoe dropping that I was Ooh. telling you about. Uh-huh. There's kind of a bunch of transits which, now that I've seen those, I've just been looking at the crop circles. And I can't help but think of transits the way that those crop circles were presented. Mm. That is, whoever created the crop circles, it's very likely that they were, they certainly take the shape, the form of planetary cycles. Mm -hmm. They have, they show cycles, they show concentric circles, they show patterns that are very precisely geometrically laid out and which People who are far more into crop circles than I am have studied and broken down into eclipse series, series of eclipses. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, they've mapped it out in terms of mathematical formulae that some of the crop circles, not this recent batch, have, uh, have seemed to be referring to. It's just mind-blowing. It doesn't, um, you know, it, it makes the... The closest reference I can think of to it is astrological cycles. Mm-hmm. And there is a website that you referred me to that um, explains how the 
let's see, the July 7th full moon eclipse is seemingly referred to in this latest one that was found in Oxfordshire. So I don't know about the solar fires that they're talking about. These are all theories. Nobody knows right. for sure because we're dealing with extremely abstract information. It's in code. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Hieroglyphics are always in code. Yes. Secret yes. information is always coded. It's never like spelled out right. in a given right. language because it's a universal truth that's yeah. trying to be conveyed. So uh, it makes perfect sense to me that they would use geometry. Yes, yes. Yeah. The universal language yeah. that has, you know, no value judgment, no connotations the way yeah. our verbal languages do. Oh, my goodness, yes. So there's this um, this presumed emphasis that these crop circles seem to be talking about on this, the 7th of July, where in California, at least, we're having a, a full moon eclipse exactly at 2.23 in the morning. Ooh. In the wee small hours of the morning. It's not a big deal eclipse from the point of view of path of visibility or totality of, of viewing. But it was seeming to be um, showcased, highlighted by this crap circle. Mm-hmm. And so the next thing we do is we look at the other transits around it as astrologers. We see what's going on. Mm-hmm. And so we have to factor in what else is happening in the sky together with the sun and the moon, which are forming the eclipse. And that is that Mars and Venus are together in the sky in Taurus. And they are squaring this Neptune-Chiron Jupiter thing. Wow. Now, I know this gets very technical, so you rein me in. And I don't know how many of your listeners are familiar with this super conjunction. But it has to do, from the point of view of archetypal astrology, with the wounds that happen in a collective because of unreality and fantasy and lies. Uh, uh, Neptune oh, oh, is yeah. lies. Wow. So most astrologers I know are associating this so-called super conjunction with the breakdown of the American dream. The lies that we've all bought into. Uh, and the credit bubble. Oh, jeez. Um, you know, the word credit comes from a Latin root that means to believe. Mm-hmm. So the whole idea of credibility and having believed in a lie mm-hmm. is very close to the meaning of the super conjunction. That it's, it's caused pain. Yeah, this yeah. is Chiron. Chiron is a planet of wounds. Go ahead. And it's interesting that the credit bubble is really a debt bubble. Yes, it's a debt bubble. Yeah. Which and, brings... Go ahead. And we're being set up for the next debt bubble in the form of a global warming legislation, which involves cap-and-trade taxation. Yeah. I think that's true. I think that the, the certainly astrologically global warming and this mess with the global economy... Mm-hmm. is all part of a piece. Mm-hmm. And it's part of kind of a, a world breakdown in various areas, all of which have to do with Pluto having moved into Capricorn. And I think we talked about this last time. Mm-hmm. You know, debt in astrology, mundane astrology, is associated with the planet Pluto. And Pluto right now is opposite the USA Venus which is the planet of values Hmm. and governs money. So what happened um, on the new moon is that the sun and the moon and the sky were right on the U.S. Venus. Hmm. So this idea, I mean, it's all in there. It's Astrologically, it's all written out exactly what you're saying, exactly what's happening. And the big shots continue to just become more grandiose, and then our illusions with Michael Jackson and Farofas at Majors, 
Yeah. Uh, and the wounds of the sexual dysfunction are all That's kind of right. mixed together in this cauldron, this seething cauldron. That's exactly right. That's just coming, bubbling up to the top like a brew, like a witch's brew. Yeah. You it's know, it's, it's and today there was an art. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say that um, also another dimension of those solstice transits are that Venus, which also governs loved ones, hmm. and Pluto governs death. Hmm. So the Pluto-Venus transit that happened on the solstice was associated with the death of people we love. I mean, in the chart of the USA, in the chart of a country, mm-hmm. a Venus means the people that the whole collective loves, mm. the beloveds of a whole nation. Mm-hmm. So it had this beloved icon trilogy. You know, the Michael Jackson thing was uh, his death triggered this outpouring of love, which is mm-hmm. Venus, mm-hmm. through his death, yes. Pluto. Yeah, yeah, and there there are examples all over the place in popular iconography of people whose death really triggers love more than their lives did. Oh yeah, yeah John absolutely. Lennon and JFK come to mind. Oh yeah, they also had Plutonian charts. Wow. So we had the three deaths of our popular icons that happened all over a couple of days, where the solstice was trying to get through its message. And then the financial world was kind of a parallel with that. Like you were suggesting, through parallel means, these the same transit was trying to get through to us. Mm-hmm. Pluto also governs the cover-ups and oh. abuses of power. Oh, good. <laughs> there was, you know, this business with Bernanke and the yeah. Fed. Yeah. You know, Bernanke now is trying to give the Fed or Reserve more powers, even more powers. Oh, yes. And um, he was grilled by Congress. Not that we put much faith in those grilling him, but the fact that it happened right around the same time. Uh-huh. It was on Thursday that, the, that Bernanke was intensely interrogated. Did you hear about this? I didn't even see it. it didn't even hit the I didn't even I didn't hit my awareness. Yeah, well it was it was just one more symptom of the series of transits. Well, what did hit it though, which shocked the the pants off of me was in the Huffington Post the headlines, I think it was yesterday when they highlighted in the a Rolling Stone article that completely exposes the manipulations of the of the monetary system to, from the Federal Reserve and the government yeah, and true. the bankers that combined from that created the Great Depression and every bubble that's ever occurred. Yeah, since. I was thrilled to see that. It really is coming out. And it, it was from our point of view, the sky was giving us the timing of the wake up call. Yes. The you know, the reason that these things are are popping now into another level of collective awareness. It isn't because they haven't been there. It isn't because they haven't been building Mm -hmm. and that anybody who's been awake could have seen them. Mm -hmm. It's that they they rupture a kind of a a crust between collective unconsciousness and collective consciousness Mm -hmm. when Mm -hmm. the transits are just right. Mm. So it's not an absolute thing. And I'm saying this because... Popular astrology would give us otherwise the feeling that transits cause these things. Right. And right. they don't. They no. cause, if anything, a rupture of that threshold of consciousness yeah. to happen so that anybody who isn't blind, deaf, and dumb will see what's been there. Yes. And, and, and alas, there are too many that are still blind, deaf, and dumb. And there will always be. So, but you know, will... this we can't let that stop us. No, no, no. There is really a a very potent idea that the New Age community has ripened into, that if there is this immense demise of the world's monetary systems, which is something that has been predicted for a long time Mm -hmm. by uh, Pluto's entry into Capricorn, and a, a massive breakdown of everything that's been considered normal in terms of the institutions that 
define wealth than mm-hmm. money distribution. Mm-hmm. If all of this breaks down, and Pluto governs breakdown, and things are reduced to more primitive, more aboriginal means, such as mm-hmm. barter, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and valuing resources which really are real, mm-hmm. like water right, and food, food <laughs> yes, instead of fictitious credit default swaps, which oh, are unreal. Yeah, yeah. This is this huge change. If things go back to this aboriginal sense of assigning worth to things that really have worth, yes, yes. which is kind of the trajectory that we would expect if the Pluto and Capricorn series of transits were to play itself out, yes. then um, it remains that the people who are too wedded to the idea of money as we know it, of money distribution as we know it, of ways mm-hmm. of thinking about money and consumerism as mm-hmm. we have known it, will be the ones to suffer. Yes, yep, yep. Whereas those who can begin to grasp the new paradigm and take off the, you know, the glasses. Remember they put the green glasses on when you went into Oz? No. <laughs> put on green glasses so everything appeared green, and they thought yeah. it really was green. Uh, yeah, yeah. So once we get, you know, those who keep the glasses on will be lost and flailing around. Yes, yes. So if one wants to talk about sort of a separating the sheep from the goats type of thing, that as we were just, hinting at, that would be the division point mm-hmm. between those who keep glomming onto the old paradigm and those who consider that Pluto is breaking down systems that were rotten and in decay and mm-hmm. need to break down mm-hmm. if the whole planetary intelligence is to go into a new age. Well, you know, what, what the thought that occurred to me when I saw that uh, jellyfish crop formation uh, and the, the coincidence, quote unquote, of July seventh was that they're saying that they're, that it, it, the analysis is that it may indicate numerous multiple solar flares. And yeah. we know that the magnetosphere of the Earth is has been weakened due to uh, whatever it is that's creating the uh, the weakening of the magnetosphere, and that these pulses could easily bring down the electrical grid, yeah. which would wipe out the finance, everything on computers. Right. Everybody would be reduced to, well, it would be anarchy, and no one would know, there would be no records of anything. Right. Of who owned what. Mm-hmm. And so, <laughs> That's right. That's the chaos. I mean, I've been waiting for this, haven't you? I mean, yes, ever, since, ever since everybody got plugged in and wired, yes. it has occurred to me... What if there was no ability to run that computer? Yes. <laughs> I, I mean, I have been really incredulous that more people haven't asked this question. Yes. And isn't it funny that the movie, that was the remake of The Day the Earth Stood Still, ends on that note that we're left, we're, we're, we're going to be annihilated, but we're left with no power. Paper and pencil. Back to paper and pencil. Yes, yes. I think it would be wonderful. I do too. <laughs> and, um, I think it would be a blessing. You know what's been what used to be thought of the only way of keeping records is now called by the strange phrase hard copy. <laughs> so yeah. that's one of the points that I will I tell everybody. Write things down the old fashioned way. Yes. And of course, if you want to get into recommendations, um to value, going back to the idea of Pluto opposed to the Venus and the USA chart, really, if we read the the essential meaning of the financial mess, it wasn't just to cause us to suffer. It was right. to get us back to what's real in right. terms of resources. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, Venus and Mars are in Taurus, the sign of resources, when they're squaring the super conjunction. Huh. So this is another clue. Yeah. That, what we were saying before, if old communication systems, as you say, are going to be disrupted, and food and water, too, everything, all the distribution systems are based on the, the computer programs that will no longer be viable. Right. Then we might give a thought to making preparations. Yes. And yeah. so those who have already made their little garden plots in their backyards are have 
smell this coming because we're animals. Mm -hmm. We can smell this coming. We really Mm -hmm. do know Mm -hmm. more than we think we know. Right. (laughs) So the other thing I would say to people is turn off the TV. Absolutely right. Get into the information streams that are true instead of the ones that are false and deadening. Yes, yes. And and doesn't that involve reconnecting again with the planet? I and think the, it would it would not we wouldn't be able to help but do so yeah. if we turned off the TV. Yeah. Because again, we're animals. Yeah. We really know we can depend on our instinct if we can find it again after it's been so wiped out by oh, yeah. all the electronic gadgetry and the failure to connect. Yes. Yeah. But the super conjunction is about that because it's in Aquarius. And you might remember a lot of us um, got into astrology and all these metaphysical ideas around the time when that wonderful musical hair oh my came God. out. Yeah, I and I don't know about that. you, but I was introduced to the whole notion of astrology through that song. The Age yes, of me too. Me too. I, I saw it live in Los Angeles. Oh! It was just unforgettable. Was that the mid-60s? What year was that? It was around that, maybe towards the 70s, I think. Mm -hmm. It was just past, I had kind of missed the 60s in San Francisco, and I don't know if you were in San Francisco. I wasn't there yet. But my goodness, and I feel like I missed a whole wonderful, just... Well, if you were at Hare. Yeah. You saw it being recorded. I think that was the theme song for yeah. the 60s and 70s. And, you know, this idea of the age of Aquarius refers to the world age that we are segueing into now, a 2,000-year chunk of time. That pe- That's what people mean when they say new age. Ah. It's part of the great year of 26,000 years. So the age of Aquarius meant the new period for the earth that's coming mm. and, and we're on the cusp of it yes this is what you different astrologers have different opinions about when it theoretically starts officially yeah. but yeah. definitely we're on the on ramp and <laughs> what what is happening now in the sky in 2009 is that these three mega planets are in aquarius oh, and no. they are stimulating that vibration in kind of a double whammy way to get us to focus on the meaning of Aquarius, which Uh is that we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that we are meant to find like-minded people to associate with. Mm -hmm. (laughs) People who understand that everything is connected. Yes, that's right. This is how I would interpret the, the layering of that Aquarius energy right now. Mm-hmm. And so that you were giving about a year here. It peaked in May, it peaked this month in July, and it's going to peak again in December, this super conjunction. It will, in December? Mm-hmm. will be the wow. last one when it's quite like this. It's going to go on wow. in a different form into 2010. Oh, my goodness. But, Thanks for a ride. Yeah. And really, you know, think of Aquarius at its highest. You think of the ability to share ideas from mm-hmm. the very high wavelengths mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to find people of like minds is the quintessential lesson of the sign Aquarius. Mm. And it, we keep being brought back to that by all these transits. That's what it wants us to do. So if we do that, that means turning our back on the nonsense. And that's why mm-hmm. I say, turn off the TV like a mantra. Mm-hmm. If you don't find it to be like-minded, turn it off. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I Is really it... sound like I'm preaching here, don't I? Well, I, I'm in total agreement with you. Yeah. And I'm just as addicted <laughs> to the tube as anyone else. I've had periods where I haven't watched it at all. I've started my vegetable garden for the first time. Oh, good for you. You know what happened? All my pine trees died. In the veg, in the fruit orchard, I had ten Japanese pine trees that were consumed by the beetle because of the drought. Huh. And a neighbor was kind enough to help me pull them all down, pull them all down by you know with an electric saw. 
<laughs> and burn them up. And as a result of that death, I have enough sun to create a vegetable garden, oh, which is now starting to grow. I mean, Perfect. from my childhood, I'm going back to the land and the garden again. And so it's, it's like this is a very real thing for me that's happening. Yeah. And the yeah. fact that it came from the death. Yes. Which some people would get stuck on, oh, the pine trees died, but you can see. That's such a wonderful personal lesson for you of the uh-huh. universal lesson that's being taught to all of us yes. with this Grand Cross, this Pluto and Capricorn business, which is, you know, the death of the monetary system, the mm-hmm. death of governments as we know it, yep. the death of the the lies that the really the media culture has perpetuated yes. is all supposed to be leading us to a glorious rebirth. Yes. yes. And I don't doubt that it is at all, but I, I do yeah. believe that there is going to be a kind of a dividing line between people who can conceive of it and people who will be lost in the fear. I totally agree with you, and doesn't that also go back to the Hopi prophecy and other, you know, prophecies, Mayan prophecy? The Hopis uh, have that uh, the the uh, carvings in the rock where humanity kind of takes a turn. A t- it's like a Y, and one goes towards destruction, and the other one goes towards renewal. Yeah, and that the ironically magnificent or perversely beautiful or something aspect of that is that that means we still have choice. Yes. Yes. So I think that those of us who uh, profess to believe, you know, in these mystical laws that everything is energy and that we create our own reality and that karma is an absolute natural law that everything we do comes back to us, Mm -hmm. then we need to do these, we need to live our lives as if that was so, Mm -hmm. rather Mm -hmm. than um, sort of quoting these as a cliche or using our metaphysics as if it was like a Sunday painter pastime. (laughs) <laughs> I love that. Because yeah. um, we now we need to consider the implications of these ideas and yeah. get them out. Yes. I think that um, we, being human, tend to abandon these beliefs when fear rears its head. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we make the claim that, well, that's fine for, you know, when I'm in meditation, but, I mean, then I have to go out and earn money. Right. You know, and the real world has these, you know, these demands, and that's, you know, it's almost like they're making the case that the metaphysical law doesn't extend into or outside of their meditation room, <laughs> or that these laws don't apply. Right, right. When they're scared of being without money. Uh, right. <laughs> so, I really think it's a time when we are all going to be pushed to practice what we preach. Yes, yes. And if we think that, you know, exactly, if we think that the world of money is really more real and that the world of, you know, being afraid is more real, more realistic, people call it practical. You know, I have to work at a job I don't love, in fact, I hate, because it's the most practical choice. Um... Does that mean that that kind of choice is exempt from the natural law of karma Mm. and that we create our own reality? Mm. So there's paradoxes here. Am I making sense? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that the paradoxes are coming up against a wall. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like uh, we've been asleep at the wheel and... Some people have jumped off the bus, Mm -hmm. but a lot of people are still on there partying and and wondering, well, what's going on? But the wall is right there. And Mm -hmm. uh, we're we're almost in in a barrel going over Niagara Falls, but we're not going to have much choice about that. We're going to be jumping. We're going to be going over the falls. Yeah, we are. And we're going over together. We're all in it together. We're on that barrel together. 
Yeah. And if we can avoid giving into the fear while not denying it, you know, mm-hmm. we must never deny these negative emotions. As if it's not that I'm saying they're spiritually incorrect to feel fear or that it's weak or that it's psychologically wrong or something. This is a, a question of accepting in a humble kind of way that we are living in critical times mm-hmm. and that fear is one of the features that we shouldn't be surprised to feel. Right. But that there, you know, this is an astrologer. You can read from the outer planets that are involved in these incredible formations. Or, to me, there are clues that the antidote to being dragged under by the fear is the faith that there is a reason why, to use your metaphor, that that barrel is going over the falls. It isn't some random, horrible, arbitrary trick that the cosmos is playing on us. Right. That faith is has to be deployed right now to counteract it. You know, the overriding idea that having faith in the things that we say we profess to believe in is really the only security we have right now. Yes, yes. And it transcends any kind of belief system or religion or philosophy or anything. It's just an intuitive faith. It's almost like the divine goddess is starting to shower us with kind of this new way of connecting. And uh, Mm -hmm. it's not what we think or what we thought it might be. Well, it's not what the powers that be (laughs) have, you know, orchestrated. Right. This is is the tricky thing. Yes, and they're orchestrating fear. They're trying for fear. I mean, at least a lot of people, you look at Jon Stewart and you can see his wonderful parodies of the news. Yeah. And, um, you know, more and more people are getting hip to the fact that, wow, it's not just an accident that these news reports are so scary, they're actually designed to be fear-mongering. That's mm-hmm. their agenda. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And Cheney going on saying, or whatever that guy, Glenn Beck, going mm-hmm. on the air saying that, damn it, what we need is bin Laden to set off a, a bomb. Did you see that last week? No, I didn't. I mean, he said, what we need is that. Oh, my goodness. In order, he meant, to wake up... Uh, people to see things the GOP way. I mean, it was the most perverse, yeah. um, you know, sociopathic the, exactly. <laughs> statement that it really is very eye-opening about where a certain sector of the population is coming from now that they're running scared. They're going to use fear yeah. as sort of their weapon of last resort. And it is their last resort. I read on uh, the Wayne Madsen report online that... Uh, the reason why Cheney was uh, on the air so much defending the torture thing, it was smoke and mirrors. Apparently, there's some kind of lawsuit, uh, the pending lawsuit that involves billions and, and maybe even more extravagant amounts mm-hmm. that he's trying to uh, skirt. And so mm-hmm. all of this was a dance, uh-huh. you know. Dance Do you mean the, the Spanish judge? The one the Spanish judge is bringing on him for war yes, crimes. I think, yes, that's it. Mm. That's it. Yeah. That guy is a brave soul. And unfortunately in Spain they're trying to shut him down too. No, oh, well, yes. But just the fact that one guy can stand up and do it is bringing more people out of the woodwork. Yes. Uh, yes. So I feel very heartened by that suit. You know, the more people who read about it, they're going to say, yeah. Yeah. And so that energy is going to feed this action. And it only takes one person. Uh, that's one what person. I thought when I read about him. Think about it. Just one person to do that, to have mm-hmm. the gall to do that. Tiananmen Square. Yeah. You know, the one person stood in front of the... Yeah. At, at least as far as we know from the per- the reporter who was able to to film that moment... Yeah. One person blocked the whole brigade. Mm-hmm. And, of course, eventually they came through and people That's died and so on and so forth. The intelligent, the most promising minds yeah. and, and, and were you know, silenced. 
and you know, a cosmic point of view needs to, I think, be be brought to bear here. Otherwise, our hearts would break. Yeah, yeah. At the martyrdom aspect, and I think that the cosmic point of view would tell us that who are we to say that that young man wasn't meant to die when he was that old, mm. rather than living to to 97, you know? Mm-hmm. Who are we to know that his soul didn't mean for him to live just that short amount of years so that mm-hmm. he could fulfill that purpose? Mm, absolutely. Uh, that's pretty much how I, I view things. And it's the only th- conclusion that seems to make any sense uh, when when you look at the the supposed tragedies of the of the world that at a soul level we arranged all this right and and this is a, this was his sacrifice and and our lives don't have to be sacrificed no. we're gifted with the blessing of being able to see and this is a, a gift that allows us to be independent of the controls and the illusions and the death that's going to be occurring around us. Yeah, to keep our hearts open to to suffering mm-hmm. at the same time that we do not have to choose it. Yes. Yeah. I mean we can't you know, this is the this is the quest, I think, yep. for for people who have made the connection and this is to put it back in the astrological framework, that as souls we decided to incarnate just when we did. Mm-hmm. You know, where is this premise, at least in humanistic astrology, that we each chose the charts <laughs> that we got? Yeah. It's not some... How could it be an accident? If, if nothing is an accident, how right. could that be an accident? Right. So there's this idea that before we became human before we drew our first breath that somewhere somehow yes we pinpointed that exact time and that exact place yep to come into the earth plane at which implies of course that we picked this tumultuous epoch yes yep that we wanted all this action and drama we wanted to be as souls we wanted to be here Yes. When this barrel was going over the falls. Yep. <laughs> yep. And I think that to get back to our power, all we have to do is to, I mean, it's not easy, but in a way it's very simple, mm-hmm. is to reconnect with the part of ourselves that did make that choice, that did mm-hmm. write that chart. Mm-hmm. And it really is to look at the at your own chart, even people who've been looking at their birth charts for decades can when they make that connection, look at their chart in a whole new way. Yes. They start looking at it as a skill set, as a set of potentials which are exactly tailored to um have them cope with these years that we call them in astrology the cardinal climax years, you know, Pluto and Capricorn mm-hmm. being the first step of it. But not even cope with it, but to achieve a kind of mastery mm-hmm. through this barrel going over the falls time. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I want to segue into into that that whole concept and in that my birthday will be approaching in September. Mm-hmm. And that's supposed to be the peak of the ongoing Saturn Uranus yes. opposition. Now, what's the, what do, what does that signify for for those of us that might be uh, having a birthday in that month? Well, you know, it means that you're going to be very sensitive to something that the whole world is meant to be changed by. You might have your finger on the pulse of mm. something in in a particularly uh, tuned-in way to mm. something that is of universal significance that has to do... I mean, there are five peaks to this opposition, okay. so it's which tells us that the universe really wants us to get this. It's going right. back and forth and back and forth to try to get us to to really get it, like a very caring teacher would come back into the room five times to go over the essential meaning, which is in a nutshell, that 
um, the status quo, which is governed by Saturn, mm. is being rent asunder by the voices of change, which is Uranus. Ah. Uranus governs revolution and radical change, very upsetting change, destabilizing change. Mm -hmm. So these two planets have been opposed in the sky since Election Day. And that's why, of mm. course, astrologers saw a different meaning, perhaps, than voters did in this business of Obama being self-described as the, the change fellow. Huh. The actual first peak of this transit, this two-year transit, was on November 4th, 2008. Huh. So here this uh -huh. icon came along to symbolize change and the new and the breaking away from this deadly, corrupt, old yes. phase. Yes. But what, it, what I see, and as astrologers who see things archetypally rather than in terms of specific politicians, mm -hmm. you know, that's a whole other level. I'm not yes. dismissing it, but I'm yes. just saying that's a different sort of level of seeing things. Yes. It's, it's like apples and oranges to compare them. They're both true. But go. when we look at things cosmically, we see it wasn't really about Obama the man. Right. After all, since that first opposition, the meaning of Obama as a symbol has changed considerably. Mm-hmm. No longer is he the hope and change man. Right. I mean, things have gotten rather more complicated. But the point is that he was ushered in at the first instance of the opposition, of the first yeah. first hit of five hits. He was ushered in as the walking embodiment of change. And what we think that means is that it was the popular uprising that he triggered. Mm-hmm. That's what Uranus really means. In other words, Uranus is the planet of the people. It's the planet of the ordinary man and woman. And what happened with not just him as an individual, as a singular human, but his whole candidacy represented or triggered or coincided with this fresh, newly engaged vigor in the populace. Are you with me? Yes. But, I mean, that's what I'm... I'm interpreting the Saturn-Uranus opposition from a rather less literal way. Now, you said that there were five of these? Uh... Yeah. The next one was in February. Okay. A couple months after the first one. And the next one will be in September. Okay. That you and were then, talking about. And then there are two more after that? There's two more after that, but, you know, um, well, there are a associated with different transits around okay. them. So okay. different of them have different strengths. But well, the, ba the basic thing to remember is that it's roughly a two-year-long transit. Okay, all right, two-year so long. So this idea of uprising, which is Uranus, being in a tug-of-war, that's the opposition, with the status quo, that's Saturn, is another theme that we see going on all over the place. All over, all over. It's popping up like popcorn in the Jiffy Pop bag. <laughs> Love it. Love it. And, and what about California? I, I, I don't want to get you off, I don't want to knock you off your, th your tr thread, but it, it, here in California, uh, we celebrated mission, uh, into the Union on September 9th in 1850. And we used to be on the cutting edge, and yeah. here we are trailing with Proposition 8 being passed and, you know, the kind of a... Almost Proposition a 13. Decay. Yeah. And, a spiritual what now? Decay and bankruptcy. Yeah, decay, yeah. And the bankruptcy and, um, you know, the education being, uh, like, down there with Mississippi. No offense to our friends in Mississippi, but... You know, as you say, it's gone from the high golden crown of the Union mm -hmm. to the to the dregs. And, <laughs> you know, Saturn, the planet in the sky, the transiting Saturn, is on the California sun right now. Yeah. So if those of you who are familiar with the Saturn cycle, it's the low point of energy. It's the point where all your faults are in your face. It's a 30-year cycle. Oh. Huh. So, 
there's a lot on the web about California's chart, and you can do more research on this from the angle of having a Saturnine downturn. Uh. But from the bigger picture, there's so many cycles to look at. In a cosmic way, I think that what California is is an epitome. It's kind of the epitomical American state. Certainly it's seen that way abroad. It's oh, yeah. like the stereotypical American is always a Californian. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. And the media projection through the movies and so on that's portrayed to the far corners of the globe is yeah. that of a Californian. Yes. So I think that in this larger sense, um, California's sheer size, you know, it's, I mean, literal geographic and agricultural output, mm-hmm. as well as its grandiosity and its grotesque, you know, larger-than-life Hollywood caricatures and its governor being kind of uh, an outsized figure. Well, and isn't it ironic that he played the Terminator? Mm -hmm. (laughs) I do. I have a blog on that. I just, you know, you can't make this stuff up. No, no. And Ronald Reagan, I mean, you know... Mm -hmm. Held up as the darling of the GOP. See herself. now, even I, as much as as closely as as more as I've seen politicians stumble and make fools of themselves, even I was shocked at the tendency of the GOP now to still be extolling him. Oh yeah, and beatifying him under whose administration we got trickle down economics. Yeah, and all yeah. over the world, the catastrophic results of yeah. trickle down. Economics are in our faces. I still can't believe that they're they are uh, able to put statues of him in the Capitol Rotunda. I mean, why isn't it being pulled down by ropes? I know, I know, I know. And the GOP is just shocking to in, to begin. I mean, it just continues to be so comically, uh, you know, insane. It's well, like, I uh, think it is becoming comical. I think they're just losing their marbles, and in a way, I think that. <laughs> That faction represents the thing to come full circle here that we were talking about at the beginning, which is when you're running scared, it really is an ugly sight. Yes, yes. You lose your grounding. Yes. You lose your capacity to see the light. You yes. lose your sense of meaning of the whole. Yeah. And I think that the Republican Party and that ilk, they want to, it's not really about their ideology. Right. You know, it's a certain mindset that will react instead of respond mm-hmm. to the changes that are happening, that will react and mm-hmm. negate mm-hmm. whoever rises up to do something to tell the truth and make um, adjustments for the changes like global warming, who all they can do is say no. Mm-hmm. That's just sheer primal idiot reactivism. Mm. It's not adding anything. It's just saying no to whatever any, the other side says. Yes, this and then continuing reaction. with the spin and the lies and manipulations and distortions. Through the media, without which they could not do it. Right. This go, comes back to the media, and we can see that in the chart of the USA. That it, the media is the linchpin. It, do you think that there has been a crack in the media? Because uh, with Keith Olbermann and Rachel Maddow on MSNBC, mm-hmm. it seems that they're actually starting to kind of mm-hmm. dig into the crust. They're, you know, it's not free media yet by any means, hardly free and hardly truthful, but they're beginning to... Yeah speak their own truth and get their voice. I'm hoping that this is just the beginning of the direction of a whole new wave of truth-telling. I think it's going to have to be. I don't think that the um, powers that be who govern the MSNBCs of the world Mm -hmm. and the CNNs of the world are going to allow anything that gets too powerful and too strong to be told under their empire. Right. But I do see that unless or until they find a way to control the Internet, it's the web that's going to be the truth-telling device that's okay. going to get us over this hump. Yes. yes. And I also believe, again, to put it in a more cosmic way, we're back to the oranges instead of the apples, that um, there isn't any way to stop evolution. 
so that the, even if the newspapers go under, God is forbid, mm-hmm. um, that there are always going to be truth tellers. There will always be truth tellers born, and they will always be born with vocal cords, <laughs> even if we have to scratch our messages into paper again. Yeah, this yeah. this this is part of natural law. So we must put our faith and our allegiances with the truth telling. Yeah. It's as simple as that. Yes. I yes. went to this incredible mime troupe play. You know the San Francisco mime troupe. I've heard of it. Well, they're they're better than ever. They're oh, fifty good. years old. Wow. They're a political agitprop group. They're the reason I came to San Francisco. I wanted oh, to perform my with goodness. them. Years and years ago. Wow. But their show in the parks, they have a new one every summer. The new one is called Too Big to Fail, and it is a hilarious, scathing, ingenious skewering oh of what's goodness. going on, the economic debacle. They absolutely tell the truth so much, I was looking over my shoulder to make sure that there weren't black helicopters ready to shoot them down because it was so radical and right on. Wonderful, wonderful. And they ended up reminding us, as they do every year, that we're the ones who have the power. The people have the power. And, you know, the media is scared to death that we'll find that out. But it's always been true, and it always will be true. Well, that seems to be a perfect moment to segue into the last few few moments of our show. It's just... I could sit here and talk with you for hours, Jessica. Yeah. Um, and There's a lot to talk about. I, you're going to have to come back so we can continue this conversation. I would love to. Oh, wonderful. Well, um, before we go, uh, would you please tell our, our wonderful listeners how they can find you and get your book, Soul Sick Nation, and uh, find out more about your work and, and uh, astro- astrological uh, materials that you offer? Well, everything's on the website, mothersky.com. And you can get my book through the website. It's called Soul Sick Nation, an Astrologer's View of America. And I also have a blog where I run um, statements about things that are happening in current events. And I also have a monthly sky watch, which talks in detail about the astrology of that month. And as you say, um, there's a link on my site, mothersky.com, to the Daykeeper Journal article that I write, a column there called American Transition. And if any of you are interested in The Mountain Astrologer, which is a print magazine, I have an article on the super conjunction in this month's, the, actually the August issue that will be coming out this month. Wonderful, and I follow your work like clockwork. I wouldn't miss oh, thank you. one of those pieces. I get so much from what you do, Jessica. You are absolutely one of the brightest lights on the planet today. Bless you. Thank you and, very much. And I can't praise your book highly enough. It just blew my mind. So thank you again, Jessica, for being on the show, and I just adore you. Such a pleasure. Thank you, Lance. All righty. Good night, Jessica. Good night, everybody, and happy 4th of July. <laughs>